but answers to all of those names. In one part of the world, that one God is called Lord God Almighty. Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, Yahweh, Eloha. In another part of the world, that one God is called Ukulukulu. In another part of the world, that one God is called Chuku Chuku, or called Nakum Po, Unveling God. In another part of the world, that one God is called Ogun, but she is called Oshun. In another part of the world, that one God is called Oludumare, Babaluaye, Obatula, but she is called Yemonja. In another part of the world, that one God is called Asa, and she's called Aset. That one God is called by many names, but the masculine and the feminine are twin halves of the same divine essence. You ain't got no God unless you got a goddess. All praise is due to Allah. called Mayat, called Newt, called by many names. But we call that one God Allah. And Allah means all in all. And it pulls all of the wonderful names together. And so that power, that spirit, that force that came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad to whom praise is due forever. And we forever thank him for coming as it is written in the sacred scriptures of the Bible that he would come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we can find no other people fitting the description of the lost brother, the lost sister, or the lost sheep except we the 50 million or more mentally and spiritually dead black men and black women here in the hells of North America. All praise is due to Allah. Give God the glory. And we thank him for raising up his messenger, his Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank the two of them for the man who we believe is the champion for the liberation and salvation of the black nation, that man who we believe is anointed and appointed for this hour of our resurrection and rise, I speak of none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. As I greet you with the greeting words of peace, assalamu alaikum. Hotep, Alafia, Shalom, free to land, and black laws for all black people. It is indeed my honor to be black again in Brooklyn, New York, and to be the guest of Brother Malachi. X, who is working with black youth, the endangered species, and working on black youth empowerment. And to be on the same dais with the minister and representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan here in Brooklyn, Minister Kevin Muhammad. And to be on the dais with the young, fiery warrior, 16 years old, that fires it up all over the country. Let's give him a black hand, young prophet. Come around. And my son is here, Stan. My son, nine years old, Farrakhan Khaled. Give him a black hand. Let me see, baby. To the members of this 
dais, distinguished members who are leaders in the spiritual world and who are guides and teachers in the community. To the representative of Minister and Dr. Kuba Abukas, the national spokesman for the Honorable Silas Muhammad, Minister Sultan, your name, brother, and Reverend Valentine, Brother Born King in the house. What's this young brother's name? And Brother Vaughn, let's give them all a black hand. And to you, my beloved and beautiful black brothers and sisters. Our subject is the Black Holocaust. 100 times worse than the so-called Jew Holocaust. Bring it, bring it here. Bring it to this side. Just this one. The Black Holocaust, the African Holocaust, 100 times worse than the so-called Jew Holocaust. Now, let's get that straight before I even get started. I don't give a damn who's in the house. Let's be clear here. Damn means condemned to hell, I see in the front row, come on up here, brother, brother Al Kareem, who is the president of the Black Student Organization at Keene College, who invited me to Keene College. Bring him on up front. Come on, black man. Give me that hand. Brother Al Kareem, give him a hand, brothers and sisters. Strong black leader from Keene College. Brother Jesus Rodriguez, Brother Jesus Rodriguez from NJIT. I wish Brother Malik Zulu Shabazz were here from Howard University. Brother Sammy D. Webb from Greensboro, and the list goes on and on. But this is the man who got all of this started. This is the man born from his mother's womb that God chose to create this atmosphere and this climate and this great era of enlightenment for black people. Brother Al Kareem from Keene College where the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan spoke on last evening. Let me get a few things straight first. To the media who would like to know what is college's position on Farrakhan. Well, guys, <laughs> let me tell you, right now, right away, listen up, buddy. I don't give a damn about the media. The media never tells the truth. They always twist it. <laughs> Lying demons. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is my spiritual father. He is my leader. He is my teacher. And he is my guide. And like any good son, I accept the discipline and judgment of my father, and I'm not running away from home. No, I'm saying. I ain't going nowhere. 30 years ago, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and his spiritual son, Minister Malcolm X, El Haj Malik, El Shabazz, Brother Omawali, 
30 years ago, this same trial was upon and before the black nation and the nation of Islam in general. 30 years ago, starting in the month of November, as it was in the month of November, 30 years later today, that Brother Al Kareem invited me to speak at King College. 30 years ago, at this same time, at this same hour, black people were wondering what was going to become of the relationship between the father and the son, Elijah and Malcolm. But the six, that was in the 60s. And the six is a nine turned upside down. But these are the 90s. And we're going to turn that six right side up. And so we will put a positive period behind the history of Elijah and Malcolm. There is no Khalid Muhammad without Louis Farrakhan. There is no Khalid Muhammad without Louis Farrakhan. Yes, I'm hurt, but I'm a soldier. I follow a divine chain of command. I'm just wounded in action, know what I'm saying? I'm a soldier. The soldier does not always understand the orders that, com that come from the command posts, that come from the communication center. But as a soldier who follows the divine chain of command, Louis Farrakhan is God's man in the midst of the black nation. I salute and follow the orders of my commanding officer and move on out, you know what I'm saying? He or she who does not learn the lessons of history is doomed to repeat them. History is best qualified and most attractive to reward our research. If we know what happened yesterday, we can intelligently discuss today because today is built on yesterday and tomorrow is built on today. And if we know what went down yesterday, then we're not likely to let the same thing go down today. Never again. Never again, never again. I must say to the whites who are here tonight, I didn't come to take no prisoners, guys. I'm not taking no prisoners tonight. Ain't no surrender. Not go tiptoe through the tulips. This is a serious subject. I'm not going pussyfoot. I'm not going dilly-dally. I'm not going to beat around the damn bush. I'm not going to pin the tail on the donkey. I'm pinning the tail on the honky. That's what I came for. All praise is due to Allah. I don't give a damn what you write about me. I don't give a damn what you put on your news. I came to fight. Will never back down. I will never bow down. I bow down to God and God alone, and I seek God's approval and the approval of His messenger, His Messiah, and His apostle, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, and the chosen people of God, the black family of God, the gods and the goddesses. That's who I seek the approval of. So to the whites who are here, it's going to be a rough ride, buddy. It's going to be a rough ride, guys. Buckle your seat belts. If for any reason this auditorium becomes depressurized, guys, oxygen masks will automatically fall from the ceiling. Please fa place the elastic band firmly around your head and place the mask or the cup firmly over your mouth and nose and breathe normally and then help the white cameraman next to you. We say that the black holocaust is 100 times worse than the so-called 
Jew Holocaust. I'm not going to bite my tongue. I said he's a so-called Jew. I said he's a Johnny-come-lately Jew who just crawled out of the caves and hills of Europe just a few days ago. I said he's a European, Caucasian, weak by nature, stale face, weak bone and weak blooded and wicked by nature. That's the teaching of Elijah. He just crawled out of the caves and hills of Europe. You guys didn't know what you were doing. Now you've gone and got me busted. I'm not the national spokesman anymore. I'm not the national, uh, national assistant anymore. I'm not the national representative anymore. I'm busted. I'm not even a minister anymore. So now I'm just going to go buck wild on you. I'm going to be just like a pit bulldog in your backside. And you know when the pit bull bites his jaws locked. And only Farrakhan has the keys to unlock these jaws. <laughs> to these Uncle Tom Negro leaders who worried my leader and my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan writing letters to him, boot licking and butt dancing and butt dancing and butt licking in the news media. You got to do something with him, Farrakhan. You got to repudiate him. You got to condemn him. To the members of the ADL, Mr. Abraham Fox man. A fox is a dog. He is a man, half dog and half man, half beast and half human who takes a surreptitious, low-down beast way of life according to the word of God. A beast, but a fox. Not a wolf, a fox. He's sly, he's slick. But we have a lesson that says, can you fool the righteous? Not nowadays. Not nowadays. You can't fool a Muslim. Not nowadays. Look at it for what it's worth. I want to tell you, as we move into this Holocaust, that these people who are called Jews, they're not even Jews. These people running around here in Brooklyn, these people are not Jews. Not Jews at all. And all these Negro leaders from the NAACP, the Congressional Black Caucus, not caucus, caucus. The president came out against me. The vice president, the old no good president. The old no good vice president. The United States Senate, S-I-N, not S-E-N. The Congress, the House of Representatives, they voted to condemn me. All of these Negroes and all these white folks came out against me. Well, you got trouble now, buddy. I don't need a title. And Brother Malachi, I appreciate your honor of me, but you cannot call me Minister Khalid Muhammad. My teacher and my spiritual father suspended me from that post and that position. And I cannot disrespect him in public and in front of all of these people and come before you under that title until such time as God moves him, if that time comes, for him to put that title back on me again. So brother is sufficient for me because the root of the term brother, the etymological root of the term brother is O-T-H-E-R. Your brother is your other self. Your sister is your other self. And so as a brother in the liberation struggle,
for the resurrection and rise of black people in the army and the nation of God. I know my brother meant well and he's used to calling me minister. But my leader suspended me from that position and I must respect his judgment. We're not repeating no history here. We're not repeating no 30 year history cycle here. We're putting a positive period behind this so that we don't have to go over it over and over and over again. They are imposter Jews. Let's go to the Bible. Can we go to the Bible? And, 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 and see what we can find when we turn to the book of Revelation. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Let the church say amen. Yeah. Let the church say amen again. Yeah. Let the church say amen one more time. We go to the book of Revelation. In the third chapter. Is it all right? And the ninth verse. And it reads, Behold. What did it say? Behold. Don't get shook up over that. Behold, all that means is, look at here, yo. All the Bible is saying is yo. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of the what? Don't be scared. Talk back to me. Talk black to me. I will make them of the what? I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of who? Yes. Which say they are Jews. Which say what? Yes. Which say they are Jews and are not. What they say? Yes. You can answer. You'll have a job tomorrow. Yes. But do lie. What? Yes. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved you. Let me read it one more time. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not Jews, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I am God and I have loved you. Is this book the secret relationship between blacks and Jews? It's the Holy Bible. Gee whiz. It's the Bible, guys. Revelation 3 and 9, buddy. I don't give a damn about you. Revelation 3 and 9 says they are the synagogue of Satan. And they do lie. Wherever there's a prophecy in the scripture of the chosen people of God, these Johnny-come-latelys who crawled out of the caves and hills of Europe want us to believe that they are the chosen of God. Now you're faced right here in Brooklyn with a man that you've been lying to the world and telling the world that he was your Messiah and now he's about to die and now all of you are wondering what in the hell are you going to do? As Ice Cube would say, you got, the, you got the wrong nigga to mess with this time. Now that's John the Revelator. This book is not the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. This is the Bible. Now are the Jews going to come out, the so-called Jews, tomorrow and say the Bible is an anti-Semitic book? Well, let's turn to, let's turn to the book of John. Where are we going? John, the eighth chapter, starting, well, we're going to start with the 31st verse and move on down and work our way around to the 44th verse. <laughs> John 8 chapter starting with the 31st verse. Why do I dog you like this? I dog you like this because Louis Farrakhan is an honorable man. Louis Farrakhan is a man of character. 
Louis Farrakhan is the man of God. Louis Farrakhan is a mercy to your raggedy, unkosher behind, but you disrespect Louis Farrakhan. So I'm going to beat the hell out of you, you no good bastards. I don't want to be popular. If I'm popular, I want to be popular from working on my enemy's backside, giving my enemy hell. As I said, I don't have to be the captain. I don't have to be the quarterback. I just want to be a lineman, down in the mud, in the dirt, digging and scratching on the line, or pulling guard, breaking white folks' backs and necks, opening up a hole big enough to drive a tractor trailer truck through so that Farrakhan with the word of God can step in the hole and go for the touchdown. That's all I want to do. I want to be one of the flame throwers of God, one of the fire throwers of God that will just burn your behind up. If you get in Farrakhan's way, I don't have to be nothing else but that, and I'm well pleased and satisfied. But before this is over, you will beg him, just like you were begging him to repudiate me. Not repudiate, repudiate. You will beg him, well, gee whiz, Farcan, minister, honorable, sir, can you get Khalid back on both, please? Can you get this guy off of us, please? You can only hold sway and power over someone who cares about you. I don't care nothing about you. I don't want to work for you. I don't want a job from you. I don't want no contract from you. I don't even want no contact with you. I don't want nothing from you. Nothing. I just want to give you hell all the way to your grave. That's all I want to do. I ain't scared to die, and I'm ready to kill. That's the Bible. Book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, said there's a time to heal and a time to kill, a time of war and a time of peace, a time to love and a time to hate. That's the Bible. I don't want to die for the cause, but I will kill for the cause. Anybody that get too hot in here for you, just raise on up out of here and step off, sissy. Step off. Now, before it's over, you'll beg to dialogue with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Before it's over, you'll beg to dialogue with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. God is going to unleash his wrath. Or he'll unleash his wrath on you. His wrath. John the eighth chapter. John the eighth chapter. Listen to me. Listen to me. God damn it, that's the way they're supposed to go out. They're supposed to go out like that every time. See ya, and I wouldn't want to be ya. That's the way they're supposed to go out with their head hung low and they're dragging their tail between their legs every time. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed blue beast. John 8, chapter, starting with the 31st verse. Sent, then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him. Who is he talking to? John 8 and 31, I'm not going to add any words to it. I'm not going to take any words out of it. I'm not going to interpret it. I'm just going to read it. All right? Then said Jesus to those Jews 
Now who's talking? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Who is he talking to? Jesus. Now Jesus is not some blonde haired, blue eyed, pale skinned, buttermilk complexion father, fella. Iron and board backside. No frills, no thrills, straight up but straight down. Mr. Six O'Clock. That's not Jesus. Jesus is a black man according to the Bible. His body like Burl, his body like Jasper. Another scripture says his body would be like fine brass, as though at bronze, as though it had been burnt in an oven. I'm talking about a black Jesus. I'm talking about a black Lord, a black Savior, a black Master, and a black Redeemer. But these boot-licking Uncle Tom Negro leaders who keep hope alive, who keep hope alive, I am a somebody, or I am a somebody. I don't rightly know who the hell I am, but I know that I am a somebody. These Negro preachers who came out against me, these Negro politicians who came out against me, you got an old Negro in this town talking about he running for senator. He should be run out of town by sundown. Or should be running for the border. How you gonna get respect? You ain't cut your process yet. Every Negro that came out against me, I have a right to answer every Negro that came out against me. I'm not speaking for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm not his spokesman. I'm not his representative. I'm not his minister, but I'm his son. I love him. I'm loyal to him. My loyalty is unbending, unending, unswerving, and I'm sure it's unnerving. But you can't pin my words on him. He was not repudiated by these Negroes. I was. And so I have a right to answer every one of them. Licking, butt licking, buck dancing, bamboozled, half baked, half fried, sissy fied, punky fied, pasteurized, homogenized niggas. But when it's time to speak out, these Negroes don't speak out. When the old raggedy rabbi, when the old raggedy rabbi, after Dr. Goldberg, or Goldstein, or Gold something, went into the mosque where the faithful were making their salat, making their prayers, killed them in cold blood in the mosque while they're making their prayers. And as they were fleeing from the mosque, the old no good so-called Israeli soldiers opened fire on them and mowed them down in the streets. An old raggedy, unkosher rabbi, one at the eulogy, he said all of the Arabs put together are not worth one fingernail of one Jew. Where was Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson? Where was Crazy M. Fume of the Congressional Black Caucus? Where were the Negroes from the NAACP, Ben Chavis? Where was old Charlie Rangel over the, with the over the hill bunch? Where was Major Owens? Where was John Lewis? Where were these boot licking Negroes? Not one of them came out and called it a moral outrage. You tell me for an old, no good, unkosher, raggedy rabbi to say that all of the Arabs put together are not worth one fingernail of one Jew does not call for a cry of moral outrage? What about Menachem Begin in the illegitimate criminal settler colony that is called Israel today, which ain't got nothing to do with God and the prophecies of God? You've got close to a million and a half to two million Jews who don't even, so-called Jews, white Caucasian Jews, who don't even respect the state of Israel. Many of them protest and, and picket outside the, the United Nations. 
when the boys come in from Tel Aviv. That's their own people who picket and protest because they say that it is not a divine state. It is not a religious state. It is not in line with prophecy and the prophecies of God. So do you call them anti-Semites? No cry of moral outrage. Menachem Begin was called a terrorist all over the world. Menachem Begin desecrating the sacred places. Menachem Begin spilling blood all over. Menachem Begin blowing up hotels. He killed the men. He killed the women, he killed the children, he killed the babies, he killed the blind, he killed the cripple, he came, he killed the crazy, and he became an honored man in the so-called state of Israel and America and other white folks honored him all over the world. No cry of moral outrage. It just came out over the wire service that the so-called Israeli soldiers were given strict orders that if they see an Israeli so-called citizen with an automatic weapon or any kind of weapon mowing down Arabs or Palestinian men, women, children or young boys in the streets with nothing more than a rock or an apple in their hand. The orders were given according to the news that has gone out all over the world that they were given strict orders that they could not open fire and so-called Israeli soldier could not open fire on a so-called white Jew Israeli citizen. They had to take cover until they emptied the a clip, then go and persuade them to give up the weapon. But if it's a Palestinian boy with a rock, kill him. If it's a Palestinian woman grieving in pain over the loss of her baby or over the loss of her young boy who's standing up for his freedom and independence and she runs out in rage and pain shoot her down in the streets because she's nothing but an Arab or a Palestinian and she's not a Jew or an Israeli these were the orders that were given where's the boot licking Jesse Jackson and the rest of these Negroes where's the cry of moral outrage from Charlie Wrangles and Major Owens and the rest of these Negroes. Oh, I will not let your behind off. No way. Now the devil gets our sister, Sister Betty Shabazz. I'll get back to John in a minute. Our sister is hurt. She's got to be hurt. She will be hurt all the way to her grave. We have to love her. The family, we have to put our arms around her. But for a no good, low down, dirty dog to sniff up behind her and come up around her to try to manipulate her pain and try to catch her in her pain and use her. That's a good woman. That's one of the queens of the black nation. One of the goddesses of the black nation. You get away from her, you no good, slimy devil. Get away from her, sniffing up around our sister. There will come a time when we are an independent nation, when we will kill you for less. When we come to power, we will kill you for less. Sniffing up around our sister, trying to manipulate her pain. That's a low down snake of the grafted type. that will go up and come up next to one of the queen mothers of the black nation. As the Holy Quran says, like a sincere advisor, like a slinking devil whispering into the minds of the men, I might add the women and the jinn. Look at him. Leave our sister alone. She's in enough pain already. Well, Farrakhan had something to do with Malcolm's murder. Oh, please. Most of us were not even around at that time. 
in the high 99 percentile or more. Many of us were not even born at that time. It's true. Excuse me. But look at it. Even though we were not around and had nothing to do with it, we're not going to let you lynch the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan like that. In the media or no way, up, no other way. Well, we want to open up Malcolm's case again. You don't really want to open it up, devil. Because by now, most know that you had something to do with Malcolm's murder. You just fake it. You don't want to really open it up. You killed Martin Luther King Jr. You don't really want to open this up. In that audience, when Brother Malcolm spoke, February the 21st, 1965, that Sunday evening, the audience was honeycombed with undercover agents and FBI and police. But not one of you stood up with your service revolver to engage the assassins of Malcolm. Not one of you stood up. Gene Roberts, along with others pretending to be bodyguards of Malcolm. Undercover agents for you, cracker. When the smoke bomb was dropped, Gene Roberts, the undercover agent pretending to be a member of the OAAU of Brother Malcolm, ran and left his post so he could get out of the line of fire because the script had already been written. These men not going to run, I don't think so. They've been, most of them have been tested. General order number five is to quit my post only when properly relieved. Gene Roberts ran to get out of the line of fire. He pretended to be giving Malcolm mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and sucking the life out of him at the same time. Now the white man puts Gene Roberts all on his TV. He's a celebrity now. Where's the moral outcry? When the San Francisco Examiner and the LA Times came out with the evidence on the raid on the ADL's headquarters and how the ADL had undercover policemen, FBI agents, CIA agents that were working inside of these departments getting top secret information and personal private information on so-called citizens, on preachers, on churches on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., on the Civil Rights Movement. Jesse Jackson know about it. Ben Chavis know about it. Major Owens know about it. Huh? Al Sharpton know about it. Where's the cry of moral outrage? Where's the condemnation of the ADL? But these Negroes are scared. Sharpton might come out, but the rest of them Negroes are scared. Our Holocaust is not just a physical Holocaust. That's why I'm covering these points. Our Holocaust is a mental, a spiritual, a moral, an emotional, and a physical Holocaust. And then you try to destroy the leadership that God raises up in our midst to get us out of this condition. Talk about you lost six million. John the Revelator just said you are a liar. The historians, the scholars, the scientists, they went to some of the death camps. They interviewed them. Some of the historians, they said, wasn't six million? They said, wasn't five million? They said, wasn't four million? They said, wasn't even three million? Some of them say, we'd be hard pressed to get two million. Some of them say we'd be hard pressed to get a million and a half. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't do the guys that bad. They've been telling this lie all these years, wait, hold it. I hope it don't scare you now. <laughs> As Brother Malik Zulu and the Defiant Giants would say, hold it, I hope it don't scare you now. Look, 
just, I didn't say it. These are the old white people saying this. Call them the anti-Semites. But you want to wash our face with your six million Schindler's List. I went to see Schindler's List. My little nine-year-old son, Farrakhan Khalid. His name is Farrakhan Khalid. We went to see Schindler's List. Yes, I was touched. Yes, I was moved. We're the chosen people of God. We're spiritual people by nature. We feel human pain and suffering, even if it's our enemy who puts us in slavery. We got some feelings. In fact, that's our problem. We got too much feeling. Spielberg stood up at the Oscars. He said a billion people were watching. He took that moment, he took that second to lay his case out before the world. I respect him for that. I honor him for that. How many black stars will take that second to stand up for their people and speak about the black holocaust? They're always so busy skinning and grinning. I'm, <laughs> I'm just so glad y'all chose me. I really don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Look at Muhammad Ali. When Muhammad Ali was out there, he took every second to talk about the struggle of his people and the divine leadership that God had raised up in the midst of the people. Howard Cosell would be so frustrated with him. Howard Cosell would say, Muhammad, 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 what about the third round? What about the third round? And Ali would say, you better shut up. I'm... <laughs> Ali would say, what about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Read Muhammad Speaks newspaper. It's time for the black man to wake up. Wake up, black man. Wake up, black woman. And they would say, wait a minute, Muhammad, Muhammad, what about the third round? He said, it's nation time. God is on your side. But these Negroes don't do that today. But Spielberg took that second before a billion to talk about the Holocaust victims of his own people. You got to respect a man like that, at least for that. We got some other things to say to Mr. Spielberg. Got a spill for him. But look at it. Jesus in the 8th chapter of John says to the Jews, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abided not in the house forever, but the son abided ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Now wait a minute, now this is Jesus telling the Jews that his word has no place in them and that they seek to kill him. Now how in the heck are you gonna tell me that you're a preacher? Jesse Lewis Jackson, Reverend Pigfoot, Reverend Tonell, Pastor Polk Chop, Reverend Doc Ham Hock, Reverend Hog Maul with the chitlin' juice running down your jaw. How you gonna tell me that you're God's man and the Jew don't even believe in Jesus? In fact, brothers and sisters, almost this whole New Testament could be considered an anti-Semitic book by the Jews because Jesus is in a constant struggle with the Jews every day in the New Testament. Every day. He told them, I am from above and you are from beneath. He told them you are an evil and an adulterous nation. He told them you are a pit of vipers. 
a pit of snakes. Huh? It was the Jews, the so-called Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They are the Jews. They carted Jesus away, the black revolutionary Messiah, to court and set up a kangaroo court to try him in a kangaroo court. Had me on the news last night talking about I'm an ex-convict. Yeah, I'm an ex-convict. So what? <laughs> Jesus is an ex-convict. Paul is an ex-convict. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey is an ex-convict. Malcolm X is an ex-convict. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad is an ex-convict. Osaji for Kwame Nkrumah is an ex-convict. Patrice Lumumba is a convict. President J.J. Rollins is a convict. I mean, we can just go through the scriptures of the Bible, the Holy Quran, and history. Seem to be the way to greatness. <laughs> you got to go through that classroom. Yes, I'm an ex-convict. Not for selling no dope. Not for misusing no black women. Not for no crimes against the black nation. You say, well, where'd you go for? <laughs> Ask the white boy, he knows. <laughs> they locked Jesus up, made him a convict, put him on death row to crucify him for heresy, high crimes and heresy. Jesus goes on here in his day-to-day -day struggle with these Jews. They ultimately crucified him. The so-called Jews crucified Jesus. That used to be a constant battle between the so-called Jews and the Catholic Church. You know, the Catholic Church was constantly cr criticizing and attacking the so-called Jews for the murder of Jesus. It was an ongoing battle for many years. Go to your library and look it up tomorrow. <laughs> he says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, if God were your father, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Wait a minute. You call me a hater. You call me a racist. You call me a bigot. And you call me an anti-Semite. And call my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, all of those names. Well, your mama is all of that, and your daddy, according to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is playing the dozen with him. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of the lie. Now Jesus is talking to the Jews. Is this the secret relationship between blacks and Jews? That... Brother Sundiata, Brother Sundiata and Sister Shandala or uh, Amin Ra and Isis are selling right outside the door. Is this the secret relationship or is this the Bible? What is this? Is this an anti-Semitic book? Let's cover this. They say they lost six million. We lost over 150 to 200.
hundred million just in the middle passage coming over on the slave ships between Africa and America. That's just in the middle passage. And for every thousand years that the white man has been on our planet, he has murdered and been responsible for the murder of one hundred million black and darker people, men, women, children, and babies. And he's been here for six thousand years. We've lost over six hundred million to this beast in the past six thousand years. That's a hundred times worse than your bloated, exaggerated, probably fabricated six million. I don't want to be your friend. If God is through with you, I'm through with you too, buddy. This is Brother James Cameron, 80 years old. In the upper corner here, I was with him in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a few days ago. I was there at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, guest of Brother Burnell Ross and Commander Michael McGee of the Black Panther Militia. You know what I'm saying. Brother James Cameron is the curator and founder and director of the American Black Holocaust Museum that is being set up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Look at this Jew. Look at this so-called Jew. Over a period of time, it is reported that 150 $50 million dollars is to be spent in setting up the Jewish Holocaust Museum on American soil in Washington DC when they say their Holocaust took place over in Germany. No Holocaust Museum for the sons and daughters of Africa displaced in the death and decadence of the diaspora of the Western world here in the hills of North America. But these no good Johnny come lately unkosher Jews can get $150 million to set up a Holocaust museum in a land where they say their Holocaust didn't even take place. The liquidation of the Krakka ghettos where Mr. Schindler, who was a profiteer, Mr. Schindler, who was a swindler, swindler's list. No good, Cracker. A profiteer. Our Holocaust is far worse than that. Our pain is far deeper than that. But you want to tell your story. But you don't want to hear our story. You're so arrogant until we're not even supposed to hurt. We're not even supposed to have any pain. But you always teach, remember the Alamo. Remember Pearl Harbor. Remember the Hitler. But you tell us, oh, forget about all of that. You're teaching hate. That's hate. Forget all that hateful stuff. But you make us remember when you got hurt. Or whenever you went through and experienced any kind of pain. You are not in the Krakow ghetto anymore we're still in the ghettos of America you're thousands of miles away from the ghettos of Europe 
but we're still in the ghettos of the hells of North America on the reservations of America. In fact, that's what they are, reservations. The only difference in us is, and the Indian is the Indian lives on a reservation and knows that he lives on a reservation, that she lives on a reservation. We live on reservations and don't even know it. You go north to such and such a street, you run out of us. You go south to such and such a street, you run out of us. You go east or west on such and such a street, you run out of what they call the niggas. We live on reservations. Far beyond ghettos. Land specifically reserved and set aside for us. We don't live all over America. We live on dots. And we go from dot to dot to dot. You say you're going to Los Angeles, you're not going all over Los Angeles, stop lying. You're going to leave the Brooklyn dot, go straight to LaGuardia or JFK, catch one of them white folks jet. You're going to land at Los Angeles airport and immediately you're heading for the Los Angeles dot. If you stop at all, you're going to stop for temporary reasons, with some greasy paper bags or buy some new glad rags or some chocolate gorillas or something, and then you're going straight on to the Los Angeles dot. It's from dot to dot to dot. Our whole existence is off far beyond a ghetto like the so-called Jew had in Europe. But it's on a reservation, it's on a dot. And that's where our total existence is. From the womb to the tomb, from the cradle to the grave. That's where we do our being born. That's where we do our schooling, our fooling. That's where we do our punking, our chumping. That's where we do it all, right on the dot. We might have a car long as this church. Where you going? One end of the dot, get in your car and ride all the way down to the other end of the dot. Turn around and go to the, back to the other end of the dot, styling and smiling and profiling for the rest of the slaves on the dot. might have a CD or a stereo as long as this stage on the dot. You hit a button down here, got to run way down there to get the CD on the dot. You are out of the ghettos, so-called you. We are still in the ghettos, still on the reservation. You came out, many of you with your own names, Though you've been slick enough to change your name in different societies, you wear whatever name is convenient so that you can mix in and blend in and usurp and supplant the society. You wear Spanish names. You wear German names. You wear, you wear English names. Huh? You wear Polish names. Oh, you're a slick one, all right. But the cover is being pulled off of you today. And I'm going to strip you buck naked so that you don't have a stitch to hide behind. <laughs> Brother James Cameron was 16 years old, August 7th, back in the 30s, Marion, Indiana. They accused him and Brother Abram and Brother Tommy, or Thomas, of raping a white girl and a little petty thwarted robbery. They went into jail, took him from, took him from the jail. They killed these two brothers, beat them with clubs and bricks and beat them and stabbed them and shot them. They were dead when they got them to the tree. But they're such vicious beasts until they hung them on the tree anyway so they could look at them. Then they came for Brother James Cameron beat him, mutilated his body, stabbed him, put the noose around his neck. And a voice penetrated the atmosphere. The white folks say they don't know nothing about no voice. I guess it's a black thing. You wouldn't understand. But a voice penetrated the atmosphere saying, leave that boy alone. Cut him down. He didn't rape nobody, he didn't kill nobody, a female voice. Brother James Cameron said, white folks backed away. 
They couldn't look at him. They were shook. He got down, they took the noose from around his neck. He staggered back to the jail cell. And he lives today to tell the story by God's grace and by God's permission. And in the Black Holocaust Museum, there's many rooms in there. He's gonna have what is called the Chamber of Horrors. And in the Chamber of Horrors, he's gonna have a black man hanging in the center of the room in a glass case in the chamber of horrors you don't know what horror is so called you I saw Schindler's list where they were shooting you in the head that's a merciful death that's a merciful death but what about being alive with both eyes open and tied up and then put in the flames where's that picture let me have what about being burned alive? Burned alive. White folks tiptoeing, skinning, grinning. Here's even a snag of toothpeck of wood. Time to get in the picture. Blood popping everywhere, flesh popping everywhere. They would sell tickets. They'd have train excursions. They would have caravans from city to city to see a nigga burned alive. What kind of mind is this? What kind of mind is this? The Bible says it's the mind of a beast. Our lessons ask the question, can you reform a devil? Let's see. Say, so can you reform a devil? Is that a question? That's the number one question and answer number 34. And can you reform devil? Answer, no. All the prophets have tried to reform him devil, but were unable. So they have agreed that it cannot be done unless we graft him back into the original man, which takes 600 years. So instead of losing time grafting him back, they have decided to take him off the planet who numbers only one to every 11 original people. And send a shout out to all the gods and earths in the house. Yeah. Then why did God make devil? That's the number one question and answer number 38 from the supreme wisdom. This is a first term examination for Mr. Elijah Muhammad, one of the lost found. It starts out student enrollment rules of Islam. The following questions must be answered 100% before submittance of student to said lesson number one. It goes on to say, then why did God make devil? Answer, to show forth his power that he is all wise and righteous, that he could make a devil which is weak and wicked and give the devil power to rule the earth for 6,000 years and then destroy the devil in one day without falling a victim to the devil's civilization. Otherwise, to show and prove that our lies, God always has been and always will be. <laughs> Supreme wisdom. Lesson number two, question and answer number 39. Now tell us, would you hope to live to see that the gods, that who? That the gods, who? Oh. That the gods will take the devil into hell in a very near future answer. Yes. I fast and pray. Allah in the name of his prophet W.D. Farad that I see the hereafter when Allah in his own good time takes the devil off our planet. Lesson number two, question and answer number 40. What will be your reward in regards to the destruction of the devil? Peace and happiness. What did they say? Brothers and sisters, you deserve a break today from this devil. <laughs> Peace and happiness. I will give all I have and all within my power to see this day for which I have waited 379 years. The 
white man is not a devil. The white man is the devil. There is no devil under the ground. Some fellow with some red pantyhose and a pink pitchfork that's going to stick you and jug you forever in an eternal flame under the ground. God Almighty has declared in his prophecy, in his scriptures, in his divine word, and it has been revealed to his prophets down the wheel of time. And God face to face and mouth to mouth with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad has told us that the white man is the real devil. And if he ain't the devil, he'll do until the real one get here. He's the real devil. No fella under the ground with no red pantyhose and no pink pitchfork. You bring me your devil from under the ground with the red pantyhose and the pink pitchfork, and we'll get one of our devils from on top of the ground. And we guarantee you that our white devil from on top of the ground will take your devil's red pitch, his pink pitchfork, strip him of his red pantyhose, and if he's lucky and our devil from on top of the ground don't kill him, he'll drive him back under the ground. Ain't no devil under the ground. The devil is alive and well on top of the ground. It takes a devil to do this. It takes a devil to rob the people. Don't tell me about Swindler's List or Schindler's List. At least when the roll call was called, the so-called Jews could answer their name, answer to their name. We couldn't answer to our name. Not only were we singing the song, couldn't hear nobody pray, couldn't hear nobody pray, we had been robbed of our names, robbed of our language, our religion, our culture, our God, our folkways, our mores, robbed of the very power of our own being. We have not only experienced a holocaust, we've paid a hell of a cost. Nothing to be compared anywhere in the annals of history and time. Even in this picture with Brother James Cameron, young white girls, young white boys, they on dates. Skinning and grinning to be in the picture. When I saw Schindler's List, I didn't see any black SS troops. I didn't see any black Nazis pulling the trigger on the white so-called Jew. I saw white men killing white men, white men killing white babies, white children, and white women. It was white on white crime. That's what I saw in Schindler's List. White man killing white man. What about the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths? What about the Norsemen, the Vikings, the Teutonic tribes? What about the Vandals that went all over, the, all over Europe and all over spilling blood and writing their history in blood? That's where the term vandalism comes from. It doesn't come from you writing on some building. Uki love Pookie. John loved Tamika, Tamika Rashan. She used to love John. That ain't no vandalism. Vandalism comes from the white warring faction called the Vandals. Blood spilling crackers. Ten year war. Hundred years war. The Hatfields and the McCoys. World War I. World War II. Bataan, Corregidor, Wa Iwo Jima, Pearl Harbor, Japan, Nagasaki and Hiroshima where the white man dropped a bomb the atomic bomb on men, women, children, and babies with no mercy. Vietnam, killing babies, men, women, and children every day, killing the elders every day. This is a holocaust. This is a hell of a cause. Where's the movie to show our holocaust? I want to meet with some of these black writers some of these black directors instead of all of this foolishness on the screen let's tell our story on the screen instead of showing us killing each other all the time let's show our story on the screen 
making all these movies where we killing each other. Scared to make a movie where we killing white folks. Make a movie where the white man is crawling and squirming in the streets and we got our gat on him, we got our nine on him, busting on him. Make a movie like that. When white folks finance them, they say, oh, gee whiz, it's just a movie. Well, let us kill some white folks then in the movie. Gee whiz, it's just a movie. But they don't want you to get used to killing white folks on the screen. They don't mind you watching us kill each other on the screen because they don't mind us killing each other. Where's the hanging? Hold that one, brother. Don't get rid of that one. Keep that one there. We need somebody else to do that. Brother, just give it. You can do it. It's okay. There's a double, triple hanging. No, it's four brothers here. This is four. This is a hell of a cause. This is a holocaust. These are not isolated examples. We were lynched every day in every way. Our singers, Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday used to sing about trees in the south with strange fruit, with blood at the root. The strange fruit, here it is. Black man, black woman. White man take the black man and cut his reproductive organ off. Cut his regenerative organ off. Cut it off. Stuff it in the black man's mouth. He was in awe of the black man. Afraid of genetic annihilation. He felt like the black man was armed and dangerous. Armed and dangerous. So he made his gun to look like the penis, which shoots bullets instead of semen or sperm. And he made it black and brown to remind him of his fear of the black man's genetic, his fear of genetic annihilation. And he calls his gun the equalizer. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Read her book, The Isis Papers. One of our noted psychiatrists and great scholars. His games deal with balls all the time. Basketball. Dealing with the scrotum sack. Football. What's the object of basketball? Keep that big brown ball from getting down on the other end of the court in that round hoop which represents the womb of the white woman with the white nets representing the blonde hair in the pubic area. Keep them from shooting, black man shooting three-pointers. Shoot from half court. Stop dribbling at half court and fly the rest of the way and in and under and over and around and slam dunk and bust the backboard. White man say, Jim West, my God. Football, keep that brown ball from getting down to the other end of the field and get between those upright goal posts with the white pads there. Don't let it get between them goal posts representing the open legs of the white female. The games that people play tell you something about their subconscious mind. But the white man stands swinging a golf stick between his legs. Not a big brown basketball, but a little white scrawny ball called a golf ball, trying to knock it in a hole in black mother earth. Baseball, little scrawny white ball. He hates it so much he tries to hit it with a little skinny stick and knock it out of sight. It's time for birth. He doesn't smoke a little skinny white cigarette, which reminds him of himself. He smokes a long, strong cigar. His fear is of genetic annihilation. 
It's a subconscious inferiorization. And so he would not only lynch the black man, but cut his regenerative organs up. Cut black male genitalia off. Take black women, nine months pregnant, stomach full and round. Strip her naked, tie her up. Tie horses to one leg, horses to the other leg. Beat the horses, make them run in opposite directions until they rip the black woman apart. That's a hell of a cause. That's a holocaust. Your Schindler's List is punk stuff in comparison to what we went through. Take pregnant black women and bring them out in front of audiences full of pregnant black women. Tie him up, take his knife, stick it into the full stomach of a black woman, rip the stomach open with his knife, reach his syphilis, gonorrhea, AIDS, nasty, slimy hand inside, snatch the unborn black baby from the black woman, throw it to the ground and crush the black baby's head with his boot heel. That's written in the white man's history books. It's written in black history books, so you'll have it in black and white. It's right there in the history book. Why would he do this in front of other pregnant black women? So that the fear of adrenaline, so that the adrenaline and fear would run throughout the circuitry of her body, coursing its way through her veins and affect the unborn baby in her womb hoping that the black baby would be born afraid of a wicked slave master. That's a holocaust. Your Schindler's List is punk stuff in comparison to the fact that many Jews played a role in the slave trade. Let's go to the book on you, buddy. I told you I didn't come to take no damn prisoners. In the Talmud, Shabbat 8, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. But it goes on to say here, all of the following so-called chosen people are confirmed to have participated in the black African slave trade. According to their own literature, each one is a prominent historical figure and most are highly regarded and respected by Jews themselves. All of the following, it says. Even the most prominent of Jewish Americans never voiced any reservation whatsoever about the practice of slavery, writes Rabbi Bertram W. Cohen. Who wrote it? Rabbi Bertram, uh, Rabbi Bertram W. Cohen. He says, even the most prominent of Jewish Americans never voiced any reservation about the practice of slavery. It is realistic to conclude that any Jew who could afford to own slaves would do so. This is what the rabbi said. Call him an anti-Semite. Where did the rabbi write this? Rabbi Bertram Wallace Cohen in his book, The Early Jews of New Orleans, page 201 and page 319. Check it out, buddy. In fact, Jews participated in every aspect and process of the exploitation of the defenseless blacks. Then it goes on to give page after page of a list of the Jews and the name of the slave ships they owned. Not only that, but it says those Jews who didn't own slave ships financed the expedition. Those who didn't finance it were in the insurance business and insured it. And the census points out that 75% of the Jews owned slaves. Only 36% of the white Gentiles owned slaves but 75% of the white Jews owned slaves. Where do we get that from?
According to the U.S. Census, according to what? According to the U.S. Census of 1830, a majority of Southern Jews owned black slaves. Ira Rosenweg, a respected Jewish authority who has published Jewish population studies, has revealed that as many as 75% of Southern Jewish households held black men, women, and children as slaves. Even more striking in 1890, when slavery was abolished, two-thirds of all of the Jewish families in the United States owned slaves. Let's call Mr. Ira Rosenweg an anti-Semite. He was a respected U.S. census taker who reported and recorded U.S. census. And he was one of your own people, white folks, white so-called lying Jews. He says 75% of your people owned slaves. But you attacked Dr. Leonard Jeffries. You're attacking Dr. Tony Martin. You attacked Brother Steve Coakley. You attacked Professor Griff. And you attack the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on a daily basis because you don't want the cover pulled off of you. Let me cover a few more things here. Throughout the history of this practice, Jews have been involved in the purchase and sale of human beings. This fact is confirmed by their own scholars and historians. In his book, A History of the Jews, Solomon Grezel states, quote, Jews were among the most important slave dealers. What did he say? This is Solomon Grezel, a Jew. In Lady Magnus writes that in the Middle Ages, quote, the principal, the what? The principal purchases of slaves were found among the Jews. They seemed to always and be everywhere at hand to buy and to have the means equally ready to pay. Let me just cover just a couple of more. I don't want to bore you here. Jews and the rape of black women. The female slave was a sex tool beneath the level of moral consideration. She was an economic good useful in addition to a menial labor for breeding more slaves. To attain that purpose, the master mated her promiscuously according to his breeding plans. The master himself and his sons and other members of his household took turns with her for the increase of family wealth as well as for satisfaction of their extramarital sex desires. Guests and neighbors too were invited to that luxury. Jews engaged in widespread practice of sexual exploitation of dependent female slaves. Such was the practice of Jews in the Middle Ages, according to Louis M. Epstein, a white Jew, Louis M. Epstein, in his book, Sex Laws and Customs in Judaism. This is Jews talking about Jews. It goes on to say that they were involved in stopping the slave revolt of Nat Turner and that they joined in to put down other slave revolts. We even have the sermons of some of the rabbis who spoke up in uh, many synagogues in support of slavery. I even have up here the voting record of so-called Israel every time South Africa's vote has come on the floor regarding apartheid. I have the vote of South Africa in the United, I mean Israel for South Africa in the United Nations. And you wonder why I called it the Jew United Nations? You wonder why I call this Jew York City? You wonder why I say the Jew University? Because you control them. And there's no question about it. I'm about to wrap this up. Where the slave ships? Look at the slave ships. Here we are stacked and packed. The Jews in Swindler's List were put in boxcars. We weren't that lucky. We had to travel for months. Most of us never made the journey. Some slave mothers would even kill their babies to keep their babies from having to go into slavery. 
We did our urination and our defecation right on each other. We slept in it for months out to sea. We couldn't move. We could barely breathe. Some of us suffocated with the stench coming up from the holes of the ship. Old slave master would choose our women and pull one out, misuse her and abuse her and tie her back up and throw her back in the hole. Some of them were such freaks they would take the black man, the men, the white slave men, and freak out with the black man and throw him back in the hole. You haven't experienced no holocaust. I tried to give you a break, but you don't want no break. No matter what we do, nothing is going to satisfy you. So, God damn it, I will never try again to satisfy you. Never again. Never again. Never again. You kill our baby here in Crown Heights. Then the old no good damn Jew goes to Israel. No cry of moral outrage, not brought to justice. If one of us would have done that, Jesse Jackson would have been the first to repudiate. All other Negroes would have jumped on the bandwagon. But here's a Jew that can go to Israel and escape prosecution. No cry of moral outrage. You didn't find what I said at King College such a moral outrage. You have a hidden agenda. You wanted to use me against my teacher. Use me against my leader. But you will never be able to get me to turn against Louis Farrakhan. It's just not in me to turn against him. It's just not in me. I'm like the Timex watch. In fact, the Timex watch ain't got nothing on me. I take a licking and I keep on ticking. I take a licking and I keep on ticking. What about Ocean Hill, Brownsville? In 1968, Jews defeated the efforts of black people in Brooklyn, New York, here to control the education of our own children in the Ocean Hill, Brownsville affair. In 1977, the major Jewish organizations intruded themselves as friends of the court into the Baki, defeat, Baki case to defeat affirmative action programs for black people, our people who are called Hispanics, Asian Americans, and our people who are called Native Americans. We got a long history with you. I'm not prejudiced. Prejudice means to prejudge. I don't have to prejudge you. We've been dealing with you, buddy, for a long time. We know who you are. And we know your ways and your dirty dealings. This is the slave ship. These crackers named the slave ships religious names. Good Ship Jesus of Lubeck. The Holy Mary. The grace of God. Can you imagine naming the slave ships religious names? George Washington, first president of the United States of America. Owned slaves. One of the founding fathers. Andrew Jackson. Thomas Jefferson. Owned slaves. You Jews, call, do you call yourself Jews? You got away from Hitler. You are... Holocaust survivor. We still in the ovens. We ain't got out of the ovens yet. If the founding fathers were slaveholders, what chance do we have? George Washington Thomas Jefferson would have babies after raping black women and sell their own children into slavery for syrup and molasses and rum. That's how wicked these beast oh. and we're still under that no Jew could stand that you get a snotty nose and start crying when you hear that the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan has just come and speak on your campus you couldn't stand it to have to celebrate holidays 
called President's Day, honoring these crackers who were slaveholders and rapers and murderers of black people. Abraham Lincoln Day, George Washington Day. Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But Abraham Lincoln said that if he could save the Union without letting the niggas go, he would do that. Abraham Lincoln said in his memoirs, I, like any white man, would like to see white men in the superior position. That's the president of the United States. Ain't no so-called Jew that can handle that. We have not only experienced the Holocaust, thank you brothers, but we've paid a hell of a cost. They would tie us behind wagons, tie us behind vehicles, and drag us through the woods or tie us behind horses and turn the horses loose in the woods until our heads and bodies hit everything and snagged on everything and was ripped and torn and mutilated and until it was nothing but broken bones and blood. You haven't experienced nothing. There's even questions about whether they ever even turned the gas ovens on. I got a right to question it. Then I want to know what did y'all do to Hitler? Everybody always talking about what Hitler did to you. What did you do to Hitler? That's white on white crime. I really, we ain't really got nothing to do with that. That's white folks' business. And don't tell no lie on me that I love Hitler. You are a liar and the truth ain't in you if you tell that lie. Well, we know that anyway, so you might tell the lie anyway. You don't love Hitler. Then we find out that it was black troops that played a major role in getting some up out of the death camps over there. Then the Jews got mad when, what was it, the Liberator or one of them, when it came out, they said they didn't want it to come out that no niggas got them out of the camps. What's the matter with you guy? Hitler didn't love us. And we sure have no love for Hitler. No love for the other side. Better check yourself before you rickety wreck yourself. We want to know the history. What was going on in Germany at that time? What were you doing? What made that man so mad with you? We got a right to ask that question. But you don't want nobody to ask that question. You want to sugarcoat it. Tell it the way you want to tell it. And then call us reverse haters, reverse discriminators. If the slave take the slave master's whip and start whipping the slave master with his own whip, does that make him a reverse slave master? We just taking your whip, whipping you with your own whip. We don't want to rule white people. We don't want to abuse white Jews. We just want to be left alone so that we can rule and govern ourselves. White people don't have to worry about us. We could never quite treat you the way you've treated us because God just didn't make us that way. Didn't make us that way. I'm almost finished. This is genocide. This is genocide. This is another Yuletide log on the fire to burn this whole people called the chosen people of God, the original Asiatic black man and woman. This is genocide. Mental, spiritual, cultural genocide. A fat, nasty cracker <laughs> with a red and white suit on. Oh, oh. And before it's over, you, oh, oh, oh. Every peck of wood in town. 
talking about this cracker gonna come down your chimney and you staying in Fort Greene. They ain't got no chimney. It's a genocide. This is madness. This is crazy. This is whack as hell. A white rabbit that lays chicken eggs. Give me a break to go and hold onions. A white rabbit that lays chicken eggs. And sometimes a white rabbit that lays chocolate chicken eggs. Some of you getting ready for Easter, 90 going 100. Lord have mercy, Lord child, Lord Jesus, it's Easter. You getting ready to get your big hat with the cherries and bananas and all stuff on top. And your Easter dress and your Easter shoes and your Easter suit. You wearing silk and satin and Uchi and Poochie and Gucci. And if you can't afford that, you're wearing the twins, Polly and Esther, for Easter. Who was Easter? This is genocide. This is a part of the Holocaust. Who was Easter? Easter is an old white sex god. Got nothing to do with Jesus, the black revolutionary messiah the black son of the living God, the black messiah, the black redeemer. What does a white rabbit have to do with Jesus? What does a white man with a red suit on have to do with Jesus? This fella gets more play than Jesus. You better stop sitting your babies on these crackers laps in these malls. Bouncing your babies on these crackers' lap. That cracker sit there talking about, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer is a cracker working at a chocolate factory in the daytime and eating chocolate black men at nighttime. You better be careful, you integrationists. Some of these white folks grinning at you, they might want to eat you. Look, let's stop lying to our babies. Give the credit to yourself. Bond with your children. Bond with your children. Stop working your fingers to the bone and then give the credit to a fat imaginary white man. Tell your babies, mommy got this for you. Daddy got this for you. Don't tell them some white man got it for them while they were asleep. Make them grow up to love you, to honor you, to respect you. And then you wonder why they grow up to be liars when you start them out telling them lies all the time. White people in pagan backward Europe used to get buck naked. The white woman would dye her body and paint her body from head to toe. She would hide in the bushes, hide in the trees, hide in the caves. The white man would go, he didn't go Easter egg hunt. The white man would Easter leg hunt. And wherever he found a white woman, he'd jump right on her right there. Sometimes two or three men would jump on one white woman. They thought that all of this silly, Perverse sexual activity is what made the flowers bloom, which made what made the birds sing, and they thought that filled the atmosphere with the fragrance of spring. The fools didn't know it was going to be spring anyway. Some white men would get naked and paint their bodies all over too, and they would go hide, hoping somebody would find them and mistake them for a white woman.
this is history. Easter, Estarte, Orista is the name of a white sex god. That's why they use the egg. That's why they use the bunny. Why do you think the bunny is the same symbol for the Playboy magazine and the Playboy bunnies and the Playboy club that is used for Easter? Estarte, Easter, or Easter. They tell you one year Jesus was resurrected in March. Next year he got up in April. <laughs> now, did he get up in March or did he get up in April? You can't get up one time, one, you can't get up one month this year and get up the next month next year. Yo, you know what I'm saying? Give me a break. This has nothing to do with Jesus, the black revolutionary messiah. Get this out of your home. Take these crackers down from your wall. Take this white Jesus down. Take your white angels down. Take your white Mary down. Take your white Last Supper, 13 crackers sitting at a table. Take them down. Put them in the garbage can and set the garbage can out on the sidewalk and let the garbage man pick it up and take it to the garbage dump. You must have a black liberation theology to get out of this holocaust, the burning of our minds, the burning of our culture, the burning of our being, and the destruction of our people and our civilization. Well, those were the key points that I wanted to cover with you. I must say this at this forum, in this forum. Don't abandon Brother Colin Ferguson. Don't abandon Brother Colin Ferguson. These are my remarks. I'm not a national spokesman. I'm not a national representative. I'm not a national assistant. I'm not even a minister. I'm a brother. And I love my spiritual father. And I'm loyal to him, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But you can't use my words against him. You were happy that he busted me. Now you got to deal with me. Don't abandon Colin Ferguson. If you abandon Brother Colin Ferguson, you should never utter the name of Brother Nat Turner again from your mouth, from your lips, ever again. Never again. Never again. These crackers jumped on Brother Colin Ferguson. They say that the old no good police, the guards set him up. They pulled some of them out of the, the blacks out of there. Let him get jumped on. And now there's a question about whether they stood there and watched him beat him. Beat him and beat him. And beat him all in his head and kicked him. Broke his nose mad with him. Don't be mad with Colin Ferguson. Colin Ferguson didn't do nothing. Colin Ferguson was under orders. God in the person. I ain't talking about no pie in the sky and the sweet by and by after we die. I'm talking about something sound on the ground while we're still around. No spook God. No no Shazam, no Abracadabra, no Hocus Pocus. God commanded Colin Ferguson. They were interviewing him the other day. He said, I can't answer to what you consider as God. In other words, he said, I answer to my God. I'm under orders, fool. God told me to catch the Long Island train. God commanded me to kill some white folks. He got on the Long Island train, tra uh, the Long Island train, calm, cool, and collect. 
some of you, I know what you're saying. And if this gets out, some of the Negro leaders will say, what an outrage. Shut up, sissy. Shut up. God sends tornadoes. Am I lying? God sends hurricanes. Am I lying? God sends earthquakes. Am I lying? God sends floods. Am I lying? God sent Colin Ferguson. I didn't send him. You didn't send him. He didn't send himself. God sent him. God told him one morning, early one morning, rise up, Colin Ferguson. Go and slay the serpent. Nat Turner had a vision. He was Reverend Nat Turner. 1831. Nat Turner had a vision say, said, rise up and slay the serpent. He had another vision of cotton dripping blood. And that Turner ran off from the plantation, but he was confused. He had read something about honor your master and love your master. And he went back and turned himself back in to the slave master. He reread that Bible. <laughs> and then he organized. And he went from plantation to plantation, killing white folks and cutting white throats. I didn't send him. You didn't send him. God sent him. What white people must ask is why would God permit Colin Ferguson to do this? It's either God's active will or God's permissive will. Why did God allow it to happen? Why would God allow one of your own whites to get up in the Texas Tower? Why would God allow it? You've got to ask this question. Don't get mad with Colin Ferguson. Colin Ferguson's under orders. He was moved. I want to back him. I want to support him. How many believe he should be supported? Let me see your hands. How many of you would have supported Nat Turner? How many of you would have supported Denmark Vesey? How many of you would have supported Gabriel Prouser? How many of you would have supported Tucson? Desaline? Nzinga? Kandasi? Ya Asante Wa? Hannibal? Shaka? All right, hands down. We need to write Colin Ferguson. We need to get, there you go, we need to get Brother Colin Ferguson's address. Don't write him no foolishness. Write him words of comfort. Write him family letters. Because most of these Negroes that normally seek publicity, they try to make every publicity event they can make. But they won't go near Colin Ferguson. They say they deny him his commissary for so many days. We got to let him know he's not alone. When he goes in that Nassau County courtroom, we should be there with him. I want to know when he goes back again. I'm sorry if I have to be. That's the way I feel. If the white man can honor his killers, if he can honor his murderers, if he can have an Armistice Day, if he can have a Veterans Day, if he can have a Memorial Day, if he can have shrines in honor of his murderers and keep their names in his history books and give them stars and bars and stripes and medals for killing all over the earth, then why can't I honor Colin Ferguson? Why can't I honor Nat Turner? I thank God for Nat Turner. I thank God for Colin Ferguson. After us going through the Holocaust that we have undergone, 
I have to thank God for them. Brothers and sisters, I have kept you long enough. I wanted to cover these points with you. And according to the genocide convention in Geneva, America has now broken, as we look at what was laid out at that genocide convention, America is now in violation of every code that came out of that genocide convention. The United Nations General Assembly has voted that Zionism is racism and they fought to turn it around. The United Nations voted in the General Assembly that Zionism is racism and they have fought to turn it around. In South Africa right now, another illegitimate criminal settler colony, our brothers and sisters in bloodletting, in a state of bloodletting and fratricide, are killing each other. But now it's coming out that the white man is furnishing them with the guns and the ammunition and the blades, the knives behind the scene. Right. Those who don't want to see the elections come off. Well, I don't want to see the election come off, but I don't want to see the blood of our people spilled in the street while the white man hides his hand and hides behind the scenes like he always does, like he has been doing with the gang members all over America. He gives them the drugs and he gives them the weapons like he did our brothers and sisters, the Indians. He would give them the drugs and give them the fire water and give them the weapons and the ammunition and cause our brothers and sisters, the red man and red woman, to fight and kill each other, and then he would ease around like he's the Indian agent. The problem in the black community is not with the crack. The problem in the black community is with the cracker. The problem is not with the crack. The problem is with the cracker. The dope is coming in on trucks and trains and boats and planes, and you know we ain't even got a canoe. It wouldn't be in our community if the white man didn't want it here. The problem is not with the crack. The problem is with the cracker who wants to keep us in this condition. The Kerner Commission 30 years ago and then reconvened today said America's two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal, and that the number one problem in America is white racism. And so we live with it on a daily and consistent basis. Let us begin to pull together, bond. Let us develop love for the brotherhood and the sisterhood. Let us rise up like Ra. Let us rise up like Ra from our ashes, from the ashes of our Holocaust to begin to create a new world order called in the Bible the kingdom of God that is to be established not in the sky, but here on this earth. I thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum.